What's up, church? Good, man. I love this service. You guys are awake, man. I'm glad you guys are here with us today. Uh, there are so many cool things going on uh, as we move into this new year. I uh, just want to let the church sell it, know and celebrate. We had a baptism yesterday afternoon, uh, and so we celebrate that. Uh, we're going to have at least one more this morning, and so a lot of great, great stuff that's going on and we're glad that you guys are here this morning let me bring you up to speed on a few things ladies uh, in less than two months i uh, will be the fresh grounded faith tour here at church the first weekend of march the fifth and sixth lord willing we're really hoping some things maybe calm down a little bit between now and then but as of right now we're maxed out about 350 for that uh, but it's Jennifer Rothschild, uh, and then the name that a lot of you guys would remember that's a special guest for that weekend is Lisa Welchel. Uh, you've seen her on TV and stuff, uh, and so she'll be here with us that weekend. There are tickets uh, on sale in between services at the table right back there in the back. My daughter's got those back there, and you can go see her after service and get those tickets. We're able to get tickets because we're the host church for 40 bucks, and so that's the best deal. Uh, so ladies, if you want to do that, uh, stop back there. Uh, also, if you, we're going to be talking, Jason's going to be finishing up today what we started last week, which is the first step of Pathways, which is our onboard ramp uh, to becoming a member of the church. And so if that's something you've been thinking about, you're ready to make that move. He's going to give you the second half of that formula, that, that portion of first step today. And then on January 19th, we're going to offer second step. And so there are sign up forms for second or third step. Uh, in the back by the photo wall if you want to stop by there after service uh, We just need sign-ups for that one because we provide food as well We want to make sure we got plenty of chick-fil-a for everybody who's here that night. All right, so uh, That's the deal on that so be sure to stop by and sign up for that And if you haven't already done so or if you did and didn't pick one of these up on all of the communion stations today uh, are copies of our membership covenant uh, which we ask you just to sign. Jason will talk about that. But if you haven't already done that and you're kind of by the end of today, you're saying, yeah, I'm ready to step over the line and say you can count on me, uh, be a part of this, then those are on the table. Pick one up uh, when you go up to get your communion or after service. And if you're ready to f sign it, fill it out, you can do that. Drop it in the offering, uh, black offering boxes or one of the white buckets or even just up here on the front of the stage. Uh, Jason and I will be around uh, at the end of the service today. We are so, so, so glad that you guys are here today. Uh, Jason's got an awesome message. We've got awesome worship. I love seeing some of our young people up here, uh, high school students playing bass guitar and singing over here. I love seeing uh, part of that. So would you guys do me a favor? Would you stand up? Would you do a virtual greeting, wave, fist bump, whatever to everybody around? And let's worship this morning. Your grace has been enough. In 
you all a new song. There's a couple lines in this song that I really love. This, the very first one says, let praise be a weapon that silences the enemy. Amen. Let praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety. Amen. See church, when we worship our God, those things that hold us, that hold us down, those things that weigh on our minds, all those things go away. So today as we learn this song together, let these words speak to you wherever you're at and know that the God of breakthrough is on your side today. Break. 
is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. Hey guys, this is exciting. This is uh, this is my friend Charles. And this is his friend William, and I say it that way because there's a story here. Because uh, a year ago, something like that, William and Hannah had been driving by here and looking for a church and decided, hey, let's check it out. And so they started coming, they started attending, and then things got crazy. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? In March last year, things got crazy. William and Hannah were part of the very first pathways that we did via Zoom. And they joined the church uh, via Zoom call uh, with several other people that day in April and then been coming. And then they started carrying out the mission of the church. We talk a lot about who's your one. And Charles was William's one, Hannah's one, one of their ones. They started inviting and he started coming. And last week after service was over he said I need to take this step and so I'm, I'm see yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It's, it's so powerful anytime a person makes this decision but I just got to tell you guys when a man makes this decision what it does for his family is legacy changing and so because of that I'm so proud of you I'm so proud of you and handing you guys for for taking this step. So Charles, I just want to ask you, do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Yes. Do you believe he died for your sins? Yes. Do you want to spend all eternity with him? Yes. All right. Because of that, brother, it gives me great privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of all your sins, the gift of the Holy Spirit in your life. celebrated right then doesn't happen without the moment we're going to talk about right now. You see, every week here at Shelby Christian, we take time to reflect upon Jesus' sacrifice on the cross and the power that comes through that and the salvation that comes through that. And today as we take communion, I want us to think about this. The freedom that we just sang about, the moment that we just experienced together as a church, all of that doesn't happen without Jesus. All of that doesn't happen without the cross. 
Most importantly, all of that doesn't happen without the resurrection. So today, let's not just be grateful for the work of the cross. Let's be grateful for the work that came after the cross and the work that's still going on today. So I'm going to pray, and then you all are free to come get communion. God, we are so thankful today. We're grateful every day, God, but today especially for the work that you did on the cross, God, and that that work, it didn't end there. But because of what Jesus did on that cross and because of what he did three three days later, God, we can celebrate. We can reflect and remember and take courage because we know that this this life, this, all these hardships that come at us, God, they're just a temporary thing because you've already won. Remind us of that today as we take part in your communion. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. And when the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Because the God I serve knows only how to triumph. Oh, my God will never fail. Oh, my God will never fail. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory before the battle belongs to you, Lord. Oh, I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord.
church family. I love that phrase in that song that says, I know how the story ends, right? Amen. Do you know how the story ends? We know. If you are a follower of Jesus and you've read this, read the end of it, you know how this ends. This ends with Jesus and his church being victorious. That's how this all ends. And so here's the deal. I know that it's like, it, the thing to do is to like be, oh, woe is me. And oh, like everything's like, everything's horrible and the world's falling apart. It is. But, but I, I just, I just not inside of me to be that kind of a person. I'm a glass half full kind of guy. And so when I look at this world, I go, God, where are there opportunities for your church, for your people Here's what I started thinking about last March. God, and this was the prayer. It's a prayer that I pray on a regular basis. God, in the middle of this chaos, would you show me where there's some opportunities to love people and to be your light in this dark world? God, opportunities in the middle of chaos. Where are they? Show them to me. Will you reveal those opportunities for me, God? And that's just what I've been praying. I've been praying that for myself, and I've been praying that for our church. I love I love today because I get to talk about 
the church. I love the church. I love what God is doing through the church, what he established. And only, God came up with this. The church, the idea of the church, the idea of us gathering together here, this family of believers. Right? This is not a man-made concoction. This is God. God came up with this. This is God's plan for this world. Have you guys, have you ever been in a situation where you felt like you were being excluded? Like where you were, you were like left out? You ever been in a situation like that where you just feel like maybe there's a group of people and for whatever reason, you were the, the odd person out? It, it happens a lot with kids, right? You know, on the playground or whatever. Like there's a group of kids get together now, you know, for whatever reason they choose to not play with a certain kid. And it's like, okay, so they're left out and they don't have a, 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 someone to play with. Those kinds of if you teachers see this all the time, parents, you guys have seen this. As a parent, when, when this happened to your kid, because it's, it's happened to all of our kids, right? At some point, like they felt like they've been left out of a group. Doesn't it just break your heart? And it's like, oh, I wish, I wish they could just find that place. That connection, that place where they, where they can belong, right? As adults, it doesn't get much easier, does it? There have been times, I'm sure, maybe even recently for a, for a, lot, of, a lot of you guys, where you just felt like, for whatever reason, you were kind of the odd person out. Maybe it was at work, and there's this little group of people, and they're kind of always kind of going off and, and talking and hanging out, and maybe go to lunch together, and you're like, you know, I wish I could get invited to that little group. I like, that'd be so much fun, or whatever, you know, or... Or in your neighborhood or um, wherever, maybe even here, that happens sometimes. I wish I could be a part of that group. You know, maybe you were in college, you know, I'd love to be a part of that sorority or that fraternity, and they just never asked you, and you're like, oh, that stinks. I, I would love it. And it just kind of breaks your heart when you're on the outside looking in. We can all relate to that from time to time. Here's the great news about the church the church. It's for all of us. If I was someone in charge of the signage around here, I'm not. But if I was, here's what I would do. I would put the biggest sign we could afford out in the front lawn, and it would just say, you belong here, right? So that everyone, everywhere, within walking distance, within driving distance, that would ever drive by Shelby Christian Church would know, hey, this is a place where, where you can you can belong. You can find connection. Because when we don't find that, when we don't have that in our lives, we struggle. When we don't have connection with other people, we struggle emotionally and physically and spiritually. Right? We just struggle when we don't have that. And we've kind of seen that played out in our lives over the last year, right? When we haven't been able to, to do that as much as, as we did in the past. And so people that isolated themselves at home, quarantined themselves, those kind of things. And it's like there was that struggle of like, oh, man, I recognize it. Early on in March, early uh, uh, April, I recognized, man, it just kind of reaffirmed it in my heart that we are just people that as a church, as a body, as individuals, we are just designed to be with other people. When we, ha when we don't have that for whatever reason, we suffer and we struggle. God knew that. He knows that. He's wired us to be connected to one another. And so we, we need the church. And we get to talk about it this morning. I'm really excited. There's a passage of, in Ephesians chapter 2. The, the, the letter, um, Ephesians, is written by the Apostle Paul. He wrote it to the church in Ephesus, a young church. And, and he wants to encourage them. These are non-Jewish people, so they would have been people who, up until this point, up until the Jesus movement is going on, they were excluded from God's place. They, were, they didn't have a place in God, with God. And so they come, Jesus comes along and says, I'm going to change all of that. There's a, there's a new day. There's a new way. And so Paul, as, as, a, as a, a Jewish person, is writing to this church in Ephesus that he visited, that he'd, he'd been there and, and preached to. He, he went on all these, all these missionary journeys to, to the non-Jewish world, and he would share who Jesus was with them. And so he writes this letter to them. He wants to remind them about something that's very important. I want you guys to listen to this this morning. He says this in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. From now on, you are no longer not you, you are you are not strangers and people who are not citizens. I'll get that. You are citizens together with those who belong to God. And then he says this: You belong in God's family. Circle the word "belong." Underline the word "family." There. From this verse, we gather some very important truths about the church. The first truth is this. The church is a family. 
It says God's family. It doesn't say the church is like a family. It says the church is a family. It's a spiritual family. And here's the thing. When you read scripture, what you realize is that your spiritual family will outlast your earthly family. So these people that you, you know, that you, you, you choose to do life with here, like that's, that's great. The people, you, you know, your, your marriage, your kids, those kind of things, those are, those are connections we have here. But what we, when we read scripture, we realize that our family, our spiritual family that will go on forever is so much broader. It's so much bigger. And it's this spiritual family that God has invited us all to be a part of. You know, some families are sick. Some families are strong. Some families are weak. Some families are small. Some families are, are really large. Some families hurt the people within the family. I, I, I'm obviously not going to ask you to raise your hand this morning, but I guarantee that every person in this room has been hurt by a family member. You know why? Because families are made up of imperfect people. And so we hurt each other. And not, maybe, maybe intentionally sometimes, but it's a lot of times unintentionally. And you know what the church is? The church is just like that. It's this group of imperfect people made up with this holy calling, but made up by, by imperfect people who will, given enough time, let you down, will hurt you, will, 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 will uh, offend you, right? The, the, given enough time, given enough length in the relationship, you, you will be hurt by someone in the church. I have. And I bet most of you who have been around for very long in the church have. I bet some of you haven't, have resisted being a part of a church or attending a church because of that. Because you've been hurt by people in that church. Because you didn't feel like maybe you belonged. Right? And so here we are this morning talking about what God's called Shelby Christian Church to be about. Who are we as a people? And so that truth number one is that we all are part of God's family. The, the second truth is this. God expects me to be a member of that family. Notice he says you belong in God's family, meaning it's God's will. It's not optional, but it's, it's a part of who we are as Christians. Just like a football player needs a team, right? Or a, a, a private needs a platoon or a bird needs a flock. A bee needs a hive. We need each other. We need that connection with one another because it's in that that we, we, we really find out who God's created us to be and, and what he has for us and for the church. The word church is used in the Bible in two different ways. It's used two different ways. Uh, several different times in the New Testament, in Ephesians, in the, the book of Acts, in 1 St. Corinthians. It's used all, all throughout. And Paul writes a lot about the church. But the church is used two different, two different terms for the church. The first term is, is the kind of the universal term for, the, for church. It's only used four times. And so the universal church would be anyone that's gathering in the name of Jesus anywhere in the world today or this week or this weekend, right? Is it people all over the world? They, they're, some of them are meeting in places like venues like this. Some of them meeting in big cathedrals, some of them are meeting in huts, some of them are meeting you know, in, in tents, some of them meeting in people's homes, some of them are meeting all, all over the world, the big, big T, big C, the church, right? Four times it's mentioned in the gospel. Every other time the word church is used in the New Testament, it's referring to this local body of believers, and that's what Jesus calls it, he, that you are this body. You are the body of Christ. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that here in a second. The third truth is this. A Christian without a church family is an orphan. Another version, Ephesians 2, states it this way. You belong in God's household with every other member of the church. And so Jesus gives us, as Christians, 30 different uh, sets of instructions in the New Testament that can't be fulfilled unless we're a part of a body, unless we're a part of of a church. Now, here's the, the thing that I've noticed uh, that this happened from time to time. When, when people decide what church they're going to be a part of, right, uh, it, it, sometimes it can come across, I've, I've noticed this before, people even use this phrase, we're just kind of church shopping. It's like, I don't know what that means, but okay. It, but I want to say like, well, it's not like the difference between Kroger and Walmart, 
our, our, our target and, and what right? it's like not like I'll go over here for a while and decide like oh that that meets my needs today or this week and then I'll all right well I kind of I'm kind of getting I'm, I'm kind of done with that I'm gonna go over here and do this for a little while and then well let's let's move back over here and like do this and so like because you can you can imagine like if, if you're a part of a body right because Jesus said you know, we are we are a part of this body and so then you can be you can be all these different things you can be, you know, the nose or the eyes, the ear, the liver, the heart, the lungs, all these different things, the arm, the leg. And so when Jesus said this picture of like you, we are this body made up of all these different parts connected to him. Right. What happens when an appendage is disconnected, when a finger is cut off or a hand is cut off or a leg is cut off. Right. Well, what happens if an organ is, is removed from the body and it's just you know, not to be gross or graphic with you, but you take, and it's laying there on the table, not connected to the body. You know, what will happen after a very short period of time if it's just laying there outside of that connection with that body? It's going to wither away and die, isn't it? And so for us, when we choose to be connected to this and then remove the connected to this and then remove connected to this, that's not going to work out really well for us. But when we say, God, your church... It's something I'm going to commit to. I'm going to be connected to that. I want to be a part of that. And let's see what you are going to do in that decision. It can really change the, the future of, of our families and our lives in an incredible way. You know, I, as a young guy, in, in February of 19, this is going to make you guys, I think he's that old. But in February of 1978, my mom and my dad came to Shelby Christian Church for the very first time. I was five years old. My sister was four, and my mom was pregnant with my younger sister. And so she had, you know, getting ready to have five ki- or three kids under the age of five, right? And so when she would go to church, um, the church they were attending at the time, there wasn't any kind of nursery or kids programming. And so she was having to wrestle me and my sister and she's pregnant. And so like, and my dad was serving as a deacon, doing all kinds of things. And so she's there and she's just like, you know, it was like she could never pay attention to anything going on in church. And so they, they attended here one Sunday uh, in February of 1978. And the, the ladies met them at the door and they said, hey, would you like for us to take your kids to our children's program? And my mom was like, yes, I would. Please take them away. I get to go sit in church and actually listen to the sermon and sing the songs and not have to wrestle these kids. And so that's what sold her. That's why I'm always so like, man, when people serve, you never know. Hey, I don't know if my mom and dad, if they would have come here and it wouldn't have been that way. I don't know if they would have just given up on church and said, and, and something else would have happened. I don't know if I would be standing here today. I don't know where I would be if they hadn't made the decision to come check this place out. And then there wasn't the opportunity for someone to serve my parents and my family in the way. I don't, I don't know what the rest of life would have looked like for us. But when you choose to be a part of a body, it can change your family forever. The big idea here today is that we were created by God to be connected to one another and to him through the church. And so here's what we do here at Shelby Christian Church. We have five things that we said, hey, what are the, if we all want to get on the same page, if we want to say, okay, we're all kind of playing, you know, working from the same playbook, if we're all talking the same way, if we're all like, we're in this together, we realize we're, we're moving forward together. What's the deal? Like, what are we signing up for? What are we a part of? What are we doing? Where are we going? And so we said, let's, let, let, these are the five things that we're going to value. Our five core values, our five core principles, our beliefs. We kind of frame them as your DNA as our DNA as a church. Like these are the things that are just inside of us that God's put inside of us to make us who we are. We're just talking about them and making them kind of putting some application to them and kind of helping us live them out in our lives. And so here are the five things. You guys, maybe some of you have never really paid attention to this because it's like in your house when there is furniture or something hanging and after a while it's been hanging there for a year or two years or five years or 10 years, you just kind of ignore it. And so maybe that's what's happened over here. But these are five words, five banners that we want to keep in front of us that kind of just exhibit what it means to be a person who's connected 
here at Shelby Christian Church. And so we're going to talk about what it means to worship, study, serve, give, and share. Each one of these, or we're going to walk through them really quickly. You guys um, have had the opportunity, we'll have the opportunity to grab one of these. We talk about this in our pathways. This is just a simple one-page one page explanation. It helps you just affirm that, hey, I'm on board with what you guys are about here at Shelby Christian Church. And so today at the end of the service, if you're interested in doing that, we can talk more about that or you can sign that and leave that with us. But let's talk about these five things. I want you guys that are a part already and been here and heard this and done this. Like here, here's the, the other part of this. Sometimes it's like, oh, this isn't for me. So I'm going to kind of kind of check out. Well, well, no, because because for you, for us, for me, it's like, oh, yeah, I remember talking about that. I remember that we say that or we do that or whatever. But it's good to see how it all fits together and then how that all kind of encourages you and inspires you to maybe in one of these areas go, you know what? I've really kind of let that area of my life really slide in 2020. Maybe that's something that you need to just reaffirm in your heart and your mind this morning in 2021 as we go forward. So here's the first one. We, we want to worship God with our thoughts, our actions, and our words. And so we say that we want to be committed to a daily personal worship. There's a passage in Hebrews 13, 15 that says this, through Jesus Therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that confess his name. And so here's the deal. If, if on Sunday morning at 10 o'clock for one hour, if that's the only time that you are, are, are praising him and worshiping him and really focused in on your relationship with Jesus, if that's all you're doing, you're, you're going to really struggle, right? You're going to really struggle with, with life and with your week because we are, we are people who God wants to connect with and commune with and, and, and be with all the time. And, and so there are opportunities for you as individuals to connect with him every day, not just on Sunday, but every day of the week. And so my encouragement to you is to look for those opportunities. Um, Back when our, um, our oldest was, was four, we had our second child, uh, Brayden, who came along. And, and so that, that fall, early fall, September that year, my wife was on maternity leave. We went on a family vacation. We went to the beach in early September. Uh, we, Brayden was born on August 1st, so he's a month, month and a half old at this point. And so we, we go on this vacation, and I know in my mind that, that Brody, our four-year-old, is an early riser. Like he's been, and this is how he's always been wired. He's in middle school now, so it's kind of like he's sleeping a little bit later, thankfully. But like he would always be up bouncing off the walls like before 6 a.m. And I'm like, is this kid for real? He's like up running around like crazy, like at 6 o'clock in the morning. Like I ain't ready to get up yet, right? But that's how he was wired, is wired. And so... But what happened was I knew this vacation, I wanted my wife, I wanted Melinda and the baby to get some rest and some sleep. And so I said, all right, when Brody wakes up really early, I'm going to grab him, swoop him up out of the condo. We'll walk down to the beach and just kind of hang out and get him out of, the, out of there and let them sleep, right? And so I didn't really think about this too much, but that first morning I woke up, he wakes me up. Uh, we, we go great, we get up, we, we hurt, try to get out of the house and, and we walk down there and it's still dark, y'all. And I'm like, this isn't right. Like I'm on vacation. It's not supposed to be, you're not supposed to get up before like the sun gets up. Right. And so we go down, we, we put our little chairs out on the beach and we watch the sunrise. And, and there's this, this beautiful in my mind. I'll always have this until the day I die of, of these. And we've continued to do this over the years that we now Melinda and Brayden have joined us. We'll all go down and do that and just kind of sit there. But there's, there's these conversations that I had with Brody when he was five and six and seven and eight and nine and 10 years old about God's creation. I mean, isn't that so cool to see how God, like the sun rises, watch it, Brody, here it comes, here it comes, you see it, here it comes, right? And then he asked these questions about like, God, or, or dad, how come God like created the water and it only comes in this far and then it goes back out and then it comes in this far and again, like, and, and like, how, how did God do all that? And it's like, bro, I don't know, man, but isn't it cool? And we would just sit there and talk about God's creation. And it would just be this like incredible. And so over the years now, now, now we'll just sit there and talk about life and talk about all kinds of other different stuff. And we have those opportunities to just stop and go, God, you're, you're so cool. And so for you, maybe there are things in your life that you just need to stop every day and be mindful of who he is and what he's done and how much he's blessed your life, even in the middle of the chaos, 
right? And so maybe it takes them being intentional and saying, you know what, every morning I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get up 15 minutes earlier than anybody else in my, in my house, 30 minutes earlier. I'm going to grab my Bible. I'm going to grab my journal. And I'm just going to spend some time with him. Maybe it's in the evening when everybody else has gone to bed. All right, I'm gonna, there, it's quiet in the house. Turn off the TV. Put your phone down. You grab your Bible. You grab your journal. You say, God, I'm going to spend some time with you. Maybe it's some worship songs every day playing on your radio that just really help you connect with him. Maybe it's as you're driving to work, you're just praying, you know, with your eyes open, but you're praying, you know, to God every day. Like God, and people are looking over going, why is that? Who's that person talking to? Nobody else is in the car with them. And you're just praying out loud. You're just talking to God because you got some time there to do that. And so we make this margin in our lives that we say, God, every day I'm going to spend time with you. I'm going to be committed to a daily personal worship with you. And then here's what happens. When we gather in here on Sunday morning at 8.30, 10 o'clock, and 11.30, you know what this is? This is a celebration of what God's already done in our lives through the week. And we're like, God, I've been walking with you every day and in every way. And now we come in here and we go, God, thank you. Even in the middle of a lot of stuff, thank you that I woke up this morning, that I have breath in my lungs, right? That you've provided me with all that you've provided me. God, you have blessed. And so like, God, you've provided a way for me to be with you in eternity forever. Thank you. That's enough. And so we worship and we celebrate. We're one heart because we've been spending time with Jesus Monday afternoon, Tuesday night, Wednesday morning. Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And it's not just like this leftover end of the week, beginning of the week extra. It's the fulfillment of what he's been doing in us and through us all week. And so that's what we talk about when we talk about worship. But the, other, the second one there is we want to be committed to a God-honoring lifestyle. That where we just say our lives are going to honor him. The choices we make, the choices we make for ourselves, for our families, for our, for our, our, our marriages, the choices that we make are going to be choices that honor him in every way. And then the third one, as we do, we want to be committed to corporate worship. We want to be committed to this idea that we're going to gather together as this body on a regular basis. And that's been hard a lot, you know, some in, in, in all this, right? And it, it, the, the, the worst for me in all this, they say, well, what's been the worst part? Like last year, whatever, was when we decided to, to, to shut down like in-person worship for a, for a month and a half, whatever that was. And, and we would come up here, staff, and just sit out in the lobby. And this place was just empty. And it's like... Oh man, this is harder than harder than we thought it was going to be. Like all these people that a lot of you know, like where this is like the family supposed to be together, right? And so we want to be always committed to that corporate worship setting, like we're experiencing right here, right now. And so when we talk about worship, that's what we talk about. The second one is we want to value study, is we want to value the Bible as God's word. It guides the way that we live our lives, and so we want to be committed to the authority of Scripture. We want to say, God, your word is the authority. It's going to guide the way I live my life. And so we're going to study it. We're going to understand it. Even when we come across something, we're like, I don't really get that. I don't understand that. We're going to get in a life group. We're going to get in a small group. We're going to commit to a Bible study. And we're going to start to dig into this. We're going to sit down with a group of people and we're going to walk through this together. And we're going to say, God, we are committed to your word. We're, going to, we're committed to studying it. A lot of, obviously, all the things that we talk about in, really in, the, in that second one in study are going to happen in, in smaller groups and in life groups and those kind of things. And so we, we commit to the authority of scripture first. The second one there is we want to be committed to advancing our relationship with Jesus. Here's what first Tim, second Timothy three says, all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good deed. Here's the deal. When you study God's word, you begin to be equipped for whatever life will throw you, throw at you. You're going to start to be equipped with God's word. And, and when you take that and, and, and put it in your heart and apply it to your life, it's going to change you. It's going to change us. This is, this is God's story. And so we are committed to it because it helps us advance our relationship. We're, we talk a lot in, in, in here and in, in the church about taking that next step. Whatever, wherever you are today, advancing in that relationship 
with Christ. And so here, here's what happens. There are people sitting here today, maybe this is the first time, like you're like 2021, I'm going to go try out this church thing. And so you pop in for the very first time, like today's the first time you've ever sat in a church. There may be people watching today online, first time they've ever engaged in the local church. And there's others of you who have been around for decades, like me, right? And you can't even fathom not being a part of a local church. And there's people all in between at different stages and steps. And here's the deal. We can all take another step. You may be sitting here today going, yep, I've taken all the steps. I got it. Check, 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 check. I got all that stuff. I'm good to go. You know, no, there's always something else we can do in advancing our relationship with Jesus. And so that's a part of this process. The third one there under study is we want to be committed to being held accountable by other Christians. A lot of that happens in life groups as well. So when you can sit down with someone who loves you and you love them, who you can share life with and they can share, share life with you and, and the, the hurts, the, the, the things that are going on in your life, the good times and the bad that you can share with them, it's impossible. It's impossible for you to sit in here on Sunday morning at, at this hour and really feel connected with each other, right? Because you're sitting in here, you're sitting in rows, you're looking this way. There's, there's really no connection with one another on a real intentional basis. It's not until you get in, in someone's home or in a circle, right? In a life group, at a coffee house, at Cracker Barrel for breakfast, wherever, right? But you decide to sit down and go, I'm going to be intentional about setting God's word with another group of people. That's going to provide you some accountability because then you start to share life with them and you start to talk about the things you're going through and you share that with, your, with those, those people. And then the next time you meet together, it's like, oh yeah, we talked about that last week or last time we met. How are things? How are things in that area? Can we, we, can, let's, let's continue to pray about that. How, how's that going? You said you were struggling with X last time. How are you, is that, let's, let's continue to pray about that and think about that and, and, and study about that. How, how can we help you along in that? The balls move forward in our lives when we commit to doing those things. The third one is, is serve. We use our talents and abilities to make a positive impact in this world. So we want to be committed to the example of Christ. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. His example, Jesus' example, is the example that we follow when we say we want to serve other people. The second one there is we want to be committed to developing a servant's heart. Notice the word develop in that phrase. A heart for serving others must be developed. We've got to work at it. It doesn't come naturally to most of us. Here, here's, what ha here's what's natural, right? When you're born, when you're, when you're coming into this world as a little baby, right? When you look up and you see these two goofy people like looking over the bassinet at you, like they're like these eyes, these, this big giant, like th these are these people that like provide everything for you. You cry, they, 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 they feed you. You cry, they change you. You do all these things. And so, so you can grow up in this world where, where you think, and then as you get a little bit older, as a toddler, a little, a, a young, young person, like in elementary school, even middle school and high school, you've got these people that always provide for you. And if we're not careful, we can grow up in this world and assume that, that this world just revolves around us. Like everything I want, everything I need, everything I desire, there are people there that, that are going to provide that for me. And then what happens is when you get out in the real world, what do you realize? Not only does the world not revolve around you, it will go on just fine without you. And then you're like, oh no, what do I do now? And so this attitude, this heart of like, I want to serve others is not something that's necessarily intuitive for us. We have to develop that. We have to put ourselves in places where that can kind of flesh itself out. I, I remember as a student minister back in the day, I would stand and we would talk and preach and talk about, you know, serving and, and loving and being and all these things. And it wasn't until we took that first mission trip where we said, you know what, let's get outside of our little bubbles Let's get outside of, of Shelbyville and, and, and let's figure out, hey, maybe there's a place where we can go and get away from the distractions and let's just see what happens. And, and I remember that first one, we went to a, a children's home in Missouri and, and our kids started getting their hands dirty and their feet dirty. And we started doing all that working all the week and I, they, they worked us. They worked us really hard that first week. But I remember seeing this, the, 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 the faith in these students come alive and a lot of them. When I started to realize, wow, this is what it means to serve in this way. And so for us, we've got to look for those opportunities to develop a servant's heart in this world. The third one is committed to discovering and using our talents and our gifts to serve him. 
One of the things that I know about everyone in this room is that you guys are all wired in different ways. There are some of you in here that are fix-it people, like and, and men and women. This is just, I know there are some. I'm not going to make you make you raise your hands, but I bet you some of you like ladies, like you're the one at home when something breaks. Like you don't let your husband do it because he'll tear it up twice as bad. And so you fix it, right? You're the fix it person in your house. You're the person I need to call, right? Because I'm not that person. There, there are things that we, all, some of you guys can sing our beautiful voices. Some of you would be fine standing up here doing exactly what I'm doing right now. Like that's part of your gifting. Some of you would be like, there's no way in the world I would ever stand in front of a group of people and do that. You know? And so we're all wired in different ways. You don't want me to grab a mic and try to sing. Trust me, it's not in my gifting but you have gifts and talents and abilities that others don't. And so God placed those with you. We have to discover what those are so we can serve the church. We can serve this community for him. And so that's what we talk about when we talk about serving. The fourth one is give. We've got two more and we'll be done. We desire to be a community of generous givers in all things. So we will be committed to generosity. First Timothy 6 says this, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in their wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. Notice that generosity is about more than financial wealth. Do good and be rich in good deeds. A healthy church will excel in generosity of all kinds. And so we can be generous with our time and our attention. We can be generous with our talents and our abilities. We can be generous with our love and our service towards others. So we should always be looking for ways to be a community of generous givers. The second one there is we want to be committed to tithing back to God. A healthy church understands that we return a portion of what we've been given back to him. And we understand that what we are is stewards. We're stewards of what God's given us, what he's blessed us with. It belongs to him. And so he's entrusted us with a portion of his wealth. You hear the nuance in that? He's entrusted us with a portion of his wealth to give back so the good can be done in this community and around the world. And then the third one there is we'll be committed to helping those in need. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. Jesus said, I was thirsty and you gave something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. We will always be a family willing to help those who struggle with basic needs. May they find their way to Jesus through our love and generosity. And then the fifth one is share. We are compelled by God's love to invite others into a relationship with Jesus. And the first thing we talk about there is being committed to telling our story. Uh, The passage is 1 Peter 3.15. It says, Always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks of you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do it with gentleness and respect. Always be prepared to give an answer for the hope that you have, church. And so here's what we ask people to do, to think about doing. It is to, to go home. Maybe a lot of you guys will go home and do this today. Grab a piece of paper, half a sheet of paper, four, five, six sentences. Think about, what, ask yourself this question. God, what are you doing in my life right now? Well, what is it that I see you doing in my life? How are you actively moving in my life and in my family, in this community? And I see you, God, I see you at work in this way, dot, dot, dot. I see you doing these things. God, I thank you for these things. And, and you look at that, and that's kind of becoming part of your testimony. Of like, all right, I've got this kind of thought out, and, I, and I've written it down. And, and so now I'm ready to share, I, I, won't, I won't be a person, a lot of times people say, I don't know how to, sh- I don't know how to share my faith. I don't know how to, how to talk about the Bible or the church or Jesus because it's so, like there's so much I don't really understand. And I get that. But here's what you do know a lot about. You do know a lot about how Jesus has changed your life, right? And you know what will resonate with people more than anything, at least in the, initially, is when you sit down with them at, at, the, at, the, at the, the, the break room at lunch, at your workplace, and, and they say, where'd you go this week? Yeah, I went to church, whatever, I got baptized, whatever. And you're like, you were there, and like, what'd you do all that for? Like, what's going on? What, like, well, tell me. And you're like, okay, I have this opportunity, and now I've, I've, I'm prepared, a little bit at least, to share. And, and then you can say something like, you know, I don't really have it all figured out, but I can tell you what Jesus has done for my life. I can tell you how he's working in my life right now. 
And, and if you got a couple more minutes, I'd love to share that with you. Let me just share it with you. And so if you're committed to telling your story, it's going to start this conversation that may start a, a little flicker of a flame that may create this fire. It changed the world. But we got to be willing to do that, right? we got to be committed to telling our story and doing it in that way. The second one there is we need to be committed to making disciples of others. We talk about your one around here. We talk about the Great Commission. We talk about saying, all right, you know, God has called us to go into the world to make disciples of others. And so who is it that God's put in your path you're one to share your story with. Here's what I know. I know this. The, the chances of this happening are 99.99% true. If you will go home, or, or even right now, if you'll pray, God, will you put somebody in my path this week that I can share my transformation story with? Will you, will, you, will you show me without a shadow of a doubt that there's someone that I'm sitting across from, that I'm talking to on the phone, that I'm communicating with on, on Facebook? Would you, would you put someone in my path, whether it's at work or school or in your neighborhood or at the grocery store, would you just put someone in my path that my path may intersect with someone else's path this week so that I can share what you're doing in my life? I'm pretty sure he's going to answer that prayer. You would not believe how many times I've shared this, this, this thought, and then I'll get a message, a text, an email, a phone call. I, I, had, a, I had a phone call from a guy one time, and, and he called me. He was like, that worked. I was like, well, yeah, I thought it would. <laughs> He's like, you're not going to believe it. This has never happened to me. And literally the day after I made that, I said that prayer, and I did what you, you said we should do, like it worked. And I was like, well, you know, I mean, I, I can get one out of 100 right every once in a while. But like, you know, that... So, like, if you will commit to sharing that story and being a disciple maker, God, God will bless that. He'll bless those efforts. And then the fifth one under share, we want to be committed to a worldwide evangelism. A lot of what we do uh, with that is played out in our missions effort here, our Together Initiative. When we say, God, you've blessed us. You've given us relationships. You've given us resources. You've given us opportunities. We want to share that message, not only with Shelbyville, Kentucky. We want, to, we want to share it with Shelbyville, Kentucky and our whole region. But we also want to share it with our world. And so we say that we want to be a people who are committed to what God's doing. And we believe that these five values help us stay connected to God and to each other. And so we just ask that those who are a part of, of what we're doing here just affirm that with that simple saying, yep, I'm in. Well, a, a membership is not really like a, a thing in the Bible. A membership is more for us to know like, hey, we can count on you. We know you're in. We know you're a part of what we're talking about when we say we're going to worship and study and serve and give and share. I love this quote from Rick Warren, he says this about the church. He says, I believe that you judge the health of a church not on its seating capacity, but on its sending capacity. How many people are mobilized for the Great Commission and sent out all around the world? He says, we're in the sending business. And so may we, as a body of believers here at Shelby Christian Church, be in the sending business. May we be a group of people who worship passionately, who study God's Word earnestly, who serve humbly, who give generously, and who share regularly. May we be that group of people in 2021. If we commit to that, if a few hundred of us commit to that, if a few thousand people commit to that, they call Shelby Christian Church home, <laughs> we could change the world. Would you guys pray with me? God, I thank you for today.
And I thank you for the opportunity to talk about your church, what you've called us to. God, we love you. But more importantly, we know that you love us. You've prepared a way for us, not just in this life, but the one to come, an eternal one, a spiritual family that we belong to forever. God, may every person that we have relationships with, that we interact with, know that they belong here because you said it. You've made a way. And his name's Jesus. How we love you. Thank you for today. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Would you guys stand with me? We're going to sing this song. If you have a decision to make this morning, we'd love to talk to you about that. A first time decision of accepting Christ. If you're ready today to just affirm your, your, the fact that you're in here, sign that covenant, leave it here with us. You can drop it in the box. You can drop it here on the stage. Make sure we get that. We love to celebrate that. Let's sing this song. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. Take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn. We saw victory today, didn't we? We saw a victory in Charles' life. I'm proud of you guys for taking all this serious and saying, you know what? There's somebody out there that I need to share this with. May, may those waters stir every week with stories of how God is changing this community and this world with William and Hannah's and Charles, with people and their lives and their stories and say, you know what? This is what matters. This is what matters. All that junk on TV and on Facebook, it's going to all go away. It's all going to go away. This is what matters. That story that you saw played out today, what God did today, 
That's what matters for eternity. A victory was won today. May one be won every day in 2021. Hey, if you guys are new, if today's your first day, go out to the I'm New Wall in the lobby. There's some guys out there that would love to connect with you. For the rest of you guys, have a blessed week. Have an incredible week. And we'll see you back here next weekend. We love y'all.